And we're just going to give it about five or ten more seconds. We'll get started here while I get the screen up. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us here on the Unified Solutions for Unmanned Infrastructure webinar. My name is Jordan Burnsett. I am joined by some wonderful gentlemen here today that are going to share with you uh, some interesting facts and information about managing unmanned infrastructure, specifically around traffic cabinets. I want to touch on our agenda very quickly. We're going to go through a quick introduction, introduce these esteemed colleagues that are with me today, talk about some of the market threats and challenges that we've discovered as we started to work with a lot of different agencies out here in the U.S. and Canada. We uh, are going to also talk about the City of Inglewood's experience. Victor will be happy to share some information there. We'll have a wrap up and we will have some questions and answer time at the end. Feel free during the entire presentation to submit your questions. We have quite a few people online that will be able to respond quickly to you or they may save those for the entire group. If we don't make it to your question, please note we will make sure we reach out to you and share that information with you later on today or tomorrow. We again really appreciate everybody being here and we want to also extend a thank you to all the ITE and IMSA members that are on here and also thank those organizations for helping us get this information out. So we're going to move forward here. I want to introduce this panel that we have here today. First off, we're very honored to have Victor Nunez. He's the Traffic Operations Manager for the City of Inglewood. Welcome, Victor. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, myself, I'm Jordan Burnson. I'm a Product and Market Development Manager with Genetech. Again, thank you all for being here. And finally, but definitely not least here, we have Gary Bruner. He's the Sales Manager for ITS and Unmanned Infrastructure with Asa Abloy Door Security Solutions. Welcome, Gary. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Jordan. So, guys, we wanted to introduce you first to the city that's uh, blessed us with their presence here today that's going to share some of their experiences, and this is Inglewood, the city of Inglewood. Uh, Victor, you want to tell us a little bit about your city um, and some of the challenges that your city faces as a whole? I think we've got Victor muted, unfortunately. Let me unmute him real quick, guys. Victor, you're going to need to unmute yourself there. Of course, there's always a little technical difficulties, guys. We're going to get this sorted out real quick. Oh, there you go. There we there go. He's back. Sorry about that, everyone. Good morning. Um, like you said, my name is Victor Nunez. I'm the Transportation Operations Manager for the City of Inglewood. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Inglewood, we are in the South Bay region of California, which just puts us about one mile east of LAX, and then about, I'd say, 10 miles southwest of downtown Los Angeles. So being in this region, we actually, well, we have a population of about 109,000 people in our city. Um, we manage 170 signalized uh, intersections with traffic signal cabinets. Um, our TMCs, which are traffic management centers are comprised of, we have our main TMC, which is at City Hall. Uh, we have a junior TMC, which is our city operations center, and then, Uh, with the stadium at SoFi Stadium, the Stadium Command Center, which is going to be an event-based operation center. Um, so that's just a little bit of background with the city and how we operate. Um, we also are the home of the Forum, which is the number one highest grossing arena in, in the world at this time. So we also are the new home to the LA Rams and the LA Chargers. Uh, SoFi Stadium is set to open in the next couple months. Uh, with a 238-acre uh, sports and entertainment development. And within that, we will start hosting a number of events, starting with the opening, which is 2020. Um, we have WrestleMania scheduled, which will attract about 100,000 uh, patrons uh, in March of 2021, which will ultimately lead into the Super Bowl 56 in February of uh, uh, 2022. 
And then from then on, we're just going to keep building events onto college football national championships. Uh, the Clippers are also starting to, uh, on, on the phase of actually building their own arena in Inglewood, which will be south of the development. Um, and then from there, we're just going to have event after event onto the Summer Olympics, which we will be hosting the opening and closing ceremonies in 2028. So a lot of big events in the city of Inglewood. And one of the biggest obstacles that we've also acknowledged and we we also start we're starting the plan uh ahead of time is just unmanned control because we are limited with staff we also we one of the big features that we wanted to have was to have the ability to remotely approve track access and monitor our system without having to go back and forth because our time is limited with all these events so that's a good background of of what we have in the city of inglewood and and what we're hoping to accomplish yeah, thanks, Victor. And wow, that's a lot of challenges. Two NFL teams, an NBA team, the fourth busiest airport in the world attached to your yes. city. And uh, incredible what Victor doesn't mention is I'm flying in that of LAX quite a bit pre-COVID. And there's also a lot of rental car agencies. And one of the primary routes to the airport goes through the city of Inglewood. So while they've only got 100,000 people, they have millions and millions of people pass through their city every day. So it's a, quite a challenge for these guys. So what we wanted to do was actually talk about some of the market threats and challenges that exist for your agencies and inside the traffic cabinet man management world in general. And one of the real challenges that we've seen as we started to move forward is this guy right here. Everybody knows this key is the number two key or the Corbin key. This is analog operations, right? And we're in a digital world. World. This key has no knowledge. It doesn't know where it's moving. It has a complete inability of providing any kind of tracking or control. As we all know, we have one. I bet a couple of you that are on this call could probably lay hands one on right now during the call. There's obviously a very evolving workforce. It's not always the city of Inglewood people that are accessing these cabinets. Victor has contractors, he has consultants, all these different groups that are accessing these cabinets, as does a lot of cities across the country. So it's not always this small trusted group of people that we can track and we know are accessing our facilities. There's a complete lack of control as this key is completely available anywhere, eBay, um, Amazon, all of these different locations, and there is an evolving workforce. It, it just predicates a large amount of lack of control, the inability to know where people are moving, what they're doing, how they're interacting with our components and things of that nature, and ultimately the mounting cyber threats. If these cabinets simply just contained a traditional controller and a conflict monitor and power, this may not be as big of an issue, but now we're connecting these via fiber and through cellular links. Victor is one of the first cities to have a full 10 gig backbone on the West Coast, so these these enable him to be very creative and manage his systems in a unique way. But at the same time, this presents a real challenge as now that's a very fast pipe right back into his city's network. So how do we protect that? How do we help keep cities safe as we move forward and we think how we want to do that? So as we start talking about this, what we really are trying to help people understand is we need to extend that perimeter, that security perimeter that we've put in our buildings, in our city halls, and in our operation centers out to that absolute edge, which is our cabinet and those that can access it. So we need to give our customers the ability to truly secure those pieces as they move forward. So just to remind you, yeah, go ahead, Gary. That's no, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and just to take it from there, and what George was talking about uh, to it, it, as what is out on the edge, we all know that that traffic cabinet's out there. We see it every day on every intersection that we go through. And that truly is the outer edge of what we're trying to bring into the whole scope of the physical security and, and cybersecurity solutions we're talking about. Those cabinets house network access, as Jordan described. Uh, they have traffic control systems that not only control the, the signals for the intersection, but a lot of other technology as well. Things like conflict monitors, radar detection, vehicle detection, um, digital message signage. So there's a whole lot of different technology that is housed in these cabinets, including surveillance equipment, you know, video surveillance that's part of these as well. Um, and as we get more into the autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles, and we see where that vehicle to infrastructure equipment is, uh, is housed in the cabinet, and that communication from the vehicle through the cabinet to the network 
begins to get gain prominence. That then also includes private data, private data from the, the person uh, in the vehicle itself through the network. So it's very important to, to protect that technology. And if you look at those cabinets, they can range anywhere from thirty dollars to $100,000 as far as the value of the technology in them. And it's all protected by, as Jordan mentioned, a $5 mechanical key that's widely accessed or available online. So there's certainly um, the technology at the edge to protect, and that's what we're focused on. Yeah, so as we move on here, I wanted to ask Victor a few questions. Victor, you know, what first brought your attention to the security vulnerabilities of your traffic cabinet network? What what prompted this thought process? We well, one of the first things that that really brought attention to us was just the cabinet tampering. Exactly what you were saying. We have an intersection that in the city that I can remember where where our cabinet was accessed without us knowing and and it really just brought to light that you're right anybody can access it with the number two key we we try to keep an inventory of all the keys that we do distribute but like you said consultants contractors have number two keys and a lot of those times we we track on at our cabinets with a logbook but not everybody uses the logbook so when we go back to that cabinet we see that there's an issue it, it's kind of an anomaly who was here when did this do so and then that leads to phone calls with our staff were you there were you there and you know we do we track our movements but not everybody else who accesses our cabinets does that so that was one of the big features of us just seeing we need more security uh, excuse me tracking the management to people that should access ca access these cabinets was one of those uh, were there other any other influencing factors related to security, like outside security threats that you guys started to take into account as you started moving forward with this idea? Yes, there is because you know not, we don't only host our uh, ITS network on our fiber. We actually host our city network, which is a closed network, and we do host as well on our fiber the PD network. So it's really important for us to keep that secure because there's a lot of information that's going through that through our substations and, and it's it's a big security concern as well for police department. What what other measures have you guys taken to protect your traffic infrastructure prior to looking at a an actual physical solution for this? So we we've done logging like you like I said, we've also added supplemental locks, which are additional locks that we have, but those can be tampered with as well. I mean we've also seen contractors go as far as you know we have a lot of construction going here i think the last time you came jordan almost every corridor in the city is under construction so we try our best to manage those corridors but there's times where you know contractors may get impatient and they can you know take their what, what they call their master key and just cut through that se secondary lock to get into it so we do use you know the secondary lock but it's just a padlock just doesn't cut it Right, so a padlock doesn't cut it because most people do cut them, right? Because that's a real challenge there. So um, as we move forward, right, guys, there was a lot of different things that we started to see as we move forward with our customers. And there were some other solutions and, and some things that we wanted to do to gain control of that infrastructure. And Gary, you want to talk about some of these items here as we move forward? Yeah, Jordan, thanks. Um, you know, when we talk about gaining control, there are a lot of things that fall under that. And the first thing that uh, that has come to mind is uh, saving a labor cost. And we, what does that mean exactly? Well, with the system that's in place today and using a mechanical key, there's no audit capability. There's no transactional historical information of when someone was in a cabinet, how long they were there. So when you utilize a system that provides you that data, you have the ability to say, Contractors are in that cabinet, they work on these specific cabinets for this specific time. And that way you can it, create that audit trail and the ability to, uh, to verify the amount of work that was done and to protect the billing from your system. So if you're getting uh, uh, inaccurate billing, this gives you the capability to compare actual use versus the invoicing and billing you get from your contractors. So in addition to that, managing the access rights, and this is an important part of any access control system and program the system to say who can go where and when, uh, which technicians and engineers can access which cabinets and when can they, or perhaps it's a contractor that's uh, 
uh, under contract to work in after hours. So you program their credential to work 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, and that's the only time they're allowed in that cabinet. So that gives you complete control over who's going in your cabinets and when. And then managing from a distance. And this is something that an online real-time solution provides. It gives you the capability from your TMC or your TOC or your command center to not only know the status of the cabinet, is the door open, is the lock secure, is someone in it, but if you need to remotely unlock that cabinet for a technician or engineer or contractor, you're able to do that remotely from your TMC. So that gives you complete control of your system. That's a great yeah. point. And we also like that we can start to digitize your SOPs here. So your standard operating procedures, being able to say, uh, for an example, if we do see a cabinet forced into via our sensors, how do we want the system to respond? But not only that, but also help drive the operators that are in your control, your traffic management centers or your traffic operation centers and actually help them know how do I need to respond? Who do I need to contact? How do I need to take these steps forward? And tracking all of that so we can learn how quickly re we respond and how easily we move forward. A couple of other things that we start to see as we start to move forward with our customers is the ability to gain that real-time information. So that digitizing of SOPs, we need to know what's going on with our cabinets very quickly. So not only knowing is the cabinet secure, but is it closed, is it locked, who's interacting with it, when somebody can interact with it, being able to know in an instant, is that Gary that's actually accessing this cabinet with things like video verification, so Genetech is a unified platform. We're able to control much more than just simply the cabinet. We can control cameras and things like that, either alone or in conjunction with other systems and be able to actually trigger that camera to take a look at or even take a quick snapshot or picture of that person accessing that cabinet so that we can actually not only see digitally that they're scanning their card, but also visibly see that yes, that's supposed to be Gary that's accessing that cabinet. Yeah, and what that does too, Jordan, is it brings uh, a new insight into the operational aspects of your system. When you're using a, a mechanical lock and key, we all know this, there's, there's no um, information that that provides back to you to give you something useful, some useful data to analyze your system. So when you deploy an online system or an offline system, um, even with Medico XT, you gain the capability of of getting data back from your system so that you can say who's accessing cabinets the most, which cabinets are getting the most attention um, to get the operational part of that data back and allow you to do something with it. It means something to you. So that's an insight that you would get, you would completely gain with a, an electronic system. Yeah, and then finally, this gives us a detailed audit trail. So not only when was the cabinet open, but who opened the cabinet, who has access at this cabinet at that time. Victor, I think mentioned a few days ago, and I will ask him to share on this a little bit more, but also when somebody accessed the cabinet, how long they were even in that area. He's already started plans to use this in very unique ways. And I think that goes right into my next question to you, Victor, but of the management benefits we've already talked about across the last two slides here, what are some of the benefits of this new infrastructure solution that Englewood's hoping to hide, hoping to utilize? So really, it's it goes to more insight as to what's going on in our cabinets, just as uh, just as what uh, Gary was talking about. We we really want the ability to know who's accessing our cabinets, um, when and why. Um, there's been times where you know even us being short staffed, it gives us the ability to also grant access remotely, like you said. If we're working at our junior TMC and some one of our consultants comes in, they can ask us for access and we can actually open that cabinet from our TMC with verification, seeing that they are there, um, live feeds. Um, whenever somebody does access it, it also takes a snapshot for our demo, our pilot program that we did uh, test. So it, it just gives us insight as to what's going on and then that compared with our logs that we keep in our cabinets also keeps everybody honest as to what they are doing in our cabinets so if we see that somebody comes in we expect to see a log written down as to what they were doing so as as you've already talked about you're planning on using this to manage and audit contractors 
are, are there other ways that you plan on using this to manage and audit different contractors maybe outside of the cabinet or or yes. uh, different groups that maybe we're not thinking of yet yeah so one thing that that i i kind of thought about so we're we're actually entering a phase in our transportation and management operations plan for the opening of sofi stadium um so we are partnering with police department um, in an ICS structure, which is an incident command structure, and we are uh, a, a supplement to PD and we support them. So one of the ideas that I had was why not use our ITS network to help track who's at what post and when they're arriving. So if you have people that are assigned to an intersection for traffic control, we're thinking of expanding the network to be able to scan in, similar to what you do when you, you know, when you open a door at, at a at a cabinet at you know, at, at City Hall or one a door. So using that same system, we can download all the information from the HID and having the permissions that we use on the system, it doesn't allow everybody to access the doors because you can create permissions. So it'll just be a tracking mechanism for in the command center to say, hey, so-and-so arrived at their post on time, which also helps us with billing and also gives confidence to, you know, the Rams or the, the chargers who are paying for, a big portion of that operation to know that we are getting to each station at the time that we're supposed to. So using this as a time and attendance tool, that's yeah. really interesting. Uh, obviously, Inglewood is making the transition to Genetech, so with your ability to link video and other components together in a single software, uh, do you guys have any plans in deploying Genetech uh, throughout your traffic infrastructure to kind of bring this more holistically into a single screen? Yeah, the VMS system, that, that was one of the main criteria that, that we were looking at be, even beforehand, because I know we've deployed Genetech here as well, but whenever we, whatever we chose to, to manage our access control had to work in line with the VMS system, because without that, I'd be opening two screens up, two separate softwares. So the ability that Genetech has partnered with us, Abeloy, has made it great because now it's all one screen. So if I'm looking at my my uh, monitoring, it just pops up as an additional screen and it'll even alert you telling you on the right hand side, somebody's accessing this cabinet or here somebody's checked in at this location. So it, it's, it's really nice to have it all on one software. That's really great notes. Thanks, Victor. So what we wanted to do was maybe introduce you guys um, to what type of solution Victor's deploying in his city very quickly. So wanted to show you how we're giving him control through technology inside these cabinets. And one of the ways is through some components that we've put together here. And what we've done is given him the ability to actually replace the hardware inside this cabinet with something that gives us the ability to truly extend access, track the operators in and out, and give us that advanced reporting and audit trails, and ultimately also that nice integration with third-party directories. Gary, you wanna talk about how this looks from a hardware perspective and how it goes into the cabinet? Yeah, yeah, Jordan, this is a, a great part. When you're looking at the two cabinets on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, the one on the left is uh, where we'd say it's an upgradable offline solution. Uh, that is our Medico XT traffic cabinet lock. And essentially, we like to say it's four screws out and four screws in. It's that simple uh, to take that existing lock out and replace it with the new electronic intelligent key lock. The cabinet on the right is a little more sophisticated in that it uses a, a similar lock, but it is a, it's an electromechanical lock that has a motor attached to it that allows us to drive that bolt on the lock electronically from a controller that's wired there in the middle of the cabinet um, that also has a card reader connected to it that's mounted there on the left-hand side of the cabinet. That controller is on the network back to the Genetech system at the, the TMC. And that's what gives Victor the capability of controlling that cabinet, just like you would a door in his building, controlling that cabinet from his system. So there's a lot of things that this gives you uh, from the cabinet on the right as our online solution. It gives you the real-time information back related to the lock and the cabinet the override capability, and being able to control that and have a real-time interaction with your video management system. It also has the capability of that lock has gone through testing for us uh, with several organizations. And one in particular, we've, uh, we've done testing to NEMA TS2 standards. Uh, and that is a requirement of technology that goes in those cabinets. 
So our hardware is tested to that standard. Um, but likewise, that offline lock, the Medico XT lock in the offline cabinet, that's fully integrated to the Genetech software. So that could give Victor or another agency the capability of doing a hybrid solution of online cabinets where they're needed, but it may be more rural areas where an online view of that cabinet isn't critical, that the integration can um, occur with the Genetech software and even provide that video verification in a forensic way. So this gives us a complete capability of deploying offline that's fully upgradable and migratable to a full online solution and gives us that upgrade path. So uh, the two solutions can work together uh, and uh, one can lead to the other. So it gives you the full solution. Yeah, and it's also noteworthy um, to mention that all of this is NEMA TS2 rated and has been independently tested as well as internally tested to meet those unique vibration and temperature ratings. Victor, as, as Gary's explained the online solution here in great detail, I wanted to find out what prompted you towards the online solution over an offline data on key solution or just going with a simple master key solution and going with another physical key? Well, we, we're, we're in the process of expanding our ITS network, um, upgrading our switches, like you said. Um, and really, one of the things that we took a step back to look at was what systems were we going to deploy, what technologies. Um, we have the ability in our cabinets to add different um, different VLANs, and we we decided just to expand on what ITS is because, like you said, it was you know we have and and I'll say this: there's a few cabinets in our city that you know can can reach about a hundred thousand dollars in equipment. So that's really why we chose. We have the network there. We want to use it. So that that's really one of the reasons why we we chose to go with the online solution. What criteria did you use when you were selecting the management solution when you were looking at how to manage these cabinets? Did you did you have some criteria that you were using? The only criteria was that it had to work with our VMS system. So that's really when we thought about it, it it, it needs to work in line with our video management system. And do you do you plan on continuing the expansion? I know the first deployment you're doing is around some new cabinets around the stadium, as that's a very hot bed of activity. How that's do you plan on area. moving forward? Yeah, that is the main area. Um, I guess we started with our pilot program, which is our hubs. Tested that for about a year um, without really any issues on it. Just a lot of reporting, which gives us the insight. And yeah, we're going on a second phase, which is the uh, surrounding the stadium and then expanding from there so any ITS project moving forward will have the access control as a feature. Great thank you so much so as we're moving forward here what we're really talking about is just providing a true way of managing this from beginning to end and a true control and protecting to the outside edge is identifying those that have access to your infrastructure. So the true edge is not even the cabinet, but really those that we call card holders or credential holders. These people that we issue an ID card to or an intelligent key to or both, that's our total edge. So being able to control and know who truly has access to our infrastructure who can influence our infrastructure, or even who's moving about our infrastructure in Victor's time and attendance in, uh, example is really the true outer edge that we need to think about. And then protecting those assets, not only this new cybersecurity uh, challenge that we have that's becoming much more prevalent. We've seen it very recently in some denial of service attacks in certain major cities and states but also just protecting all the assets that exist in these cabinets. As we've moved about, we've met with a lot of different agencies that have even shared about people breaking into these, attempting to steal power or stealing a controller and trying to pawn it and really realizing that that's absolutely useless to a pawn shop. Uh, then building those insights, right? So we're, we're protecting the, to that outer edge, we're identifying those people, we're protecting our assets, now we're building insights. It's not only an insight of who accessed that cabinet or even who's near that cabinet, but how often that cabinet's open, how, who's, 
in their working? Can we compare this to billing? Can we help save ourselves money as we've seen in some proof of concepts with other agencies that we're working with and seeing how we can enhance their operations and give them the ability to not only secure but also manage more frequently and that goes to that contractor management. And it's not just the consultant, it's not just the guy installing, it's not just the law enforcement officer nearby. It's a holistic view of knowing how people are interacting with these components that are really, really a crucial piece of the city that exists. And so, I mean, this is just, we're attempting to try to look at this from a holistic view. Gary, do you have any final notes on this as we move forward into the questions? Yeah, Jordan, it, it's interesting. All those things you just talked about, you know, when you and I first got involved in this market and this industry, uh, we were really asked to come up with a, a, a secure or access control solution for traffic cabinet. And that's the way we, we approached it. Uh, but once we got into the, the industry and really learned and understood what the need was, it's not just physical security. It's not just cyber security. Those things are very important. But just those things you talked about and, and gaining the insights into the system, the identification, tracking all that with contractors, it, it's a business management solution, uh, an operations management solution for an organization like Victor's to not only provide security and access control for the very heart of their traffic control grid, but to provide them all this data that really turns into useful information for them to do something with and better manage their operations. And, and I'll add to that as well. I think we've already had a few instances in our demo cabinets where we have used the system to better manage our staff as well you know there's times where we have you know metro come through a contract i believe victor froze <laughs> network out in california i'm telling you so uh, while we hope to get Victor back online, I think what we'll do is we'll move on here to questions. I don't want to keep everybody too long. Victor, when you get back, just jump right in. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, there he is. there he is. Yeah. So I, I was going on just how we're how it's helping supplement with with our staff. Um, we really there's been times where we don't have to pull resources to go grant access at locations, and that helps the neighboring agencies too. You know, sometimes there's unscheduled events that come through or just just access for them to maintain their system that also lives in our cabinets where we've already used that system and it's allowed us to do other work so it, it really is a supplement to help us manage our and operate our network efficiently that's really what it is great so we want to get to a few of your questions uh, we have some people that have been on the back and they've been monitoring the questions i'm going to ask despina if you'll please unmute yourself she is uh head of our marketing for access control. Despina, do we have any questions that we could throw to the panel here and see if we can help people get a clear picture of what we're doing? Absolutely, Jordan. Um, so one question that I think is directed towards Victor, I'll start with that one, is how many keys would be required for a system of your size and how will you refresh the keys? Okay, um, so keys per I guess we're we're putting one access control per door, um, which would only access the front side of the cabinet. So that would be the 157 that we have, um, and then also act, so a total of 170. Um, so I think are you talking about access control, the badging? Is that? I think so I the think answer... there may be some confusion, Jordan. Maybe you could you could clarify that about the yeah. keys versus uh, using access control. Yeah, so one thing that we've done with some of our cities and we plan on doing with Victor's as well as I've been helping Victor design this is he's he's not only designing his cabinets, but he's designing entire new TMCs and traffic management. Uh, poor guy's been overwhelmed. But what we're going to do here and what we typically do is with some of the other cities we've already done in deployment is most operators simply receive the traditional RFID card, the ones you use to get in your building, you get into your offices, they'll be issued those types of cards. And one of the other cities that we've got a great deployment in is the city of Atlanta. Not everyone carries around a physical key anymore, the Medico Intelligent Key. It's typically supervisors and things like that that have those keys. And then everyone else uses an RFID key. So it's a low cost uh, loss if we have someone that loses a key 
It's very easy to replace. And we can even adopt their keys if they already have them as we're using a unique card reader that can support multiple formats. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I didn't catch that first part either. So that I came on after I had a delay here. But yeah, yeah. But like Jordan said, we will we all our city already uses the the RFID chip badging. So we've almost completely done away with master keys, except for like Jordan said, uh, supervisors and managers. So our supervisors and our managers will have the master keys and then we'll keep those in our TMC. But even our police department, our city staff, everybody already carries around our badges, which can easily be carried over to, to the software. And, and Jordan and I have already done that to all our staff members and even a few consultants that carry their own HID um, badging as well. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is, there are NEMA-based, so N-E-M-A-based timers that have access codes, door alarms, open, close, et cetera, database changes, and the like. What does this do versus what's in, in place systems don't? So I think I, I and Gary could probably answer that. We have met with agencies that are using different contacts on power supplies or switches and things like that that give us basic monitoring of is the door open or closed or um, maybe in some cases temperature ratings and things like that. One thing that we found is the actual identification of the user that's accessing the cabinet. It's not just simply knowing if the door is open. We've met with quite a few agencies that know whether or not their door is open. Should that door be open and who opened it are two extremely important things when you start talking about network security. Gary, you wanna elaborate on that? Yeah, there, there are a lot of rules that are based in an access control system. Um, and while there's technology out there that could certainly drive an electric lock, that, that's not the, the critical nature of it. The, the important part is the access control rules around, like Jordan's saying, when can that person access that cabinet? Um, maybe it's even a two-man rule where two people have to be at the cabinet. Uh, there are a lot of different rules that, that come with the access control side of it that other systems don't have when they're not really designed for access control. So, and, and I'll add to that as well, our traffic management software that we already use, um, which is our McCain Transparency, does give us the alarm feature. So like one of the, whoever answered the question, asked the question, yes, we do monitor that the door is open and closed and it will give us an alarm, but having that additional feature of knowing exactly who did it with a, with a snapshot of who's actually there is a big difference. This also, if I can add to that, we've met with some cities that have recently shown great interest in this because they do monitor their cabinets and they have thousands of cabinets. Now they have 5,000 alarms a day. It's physically impossible to confirm all those alarms. Being able to control and issue that control mm -hmm. over the cabinet drastically reduces those alarms and using that digitization of your SOPs helps you cut through that noise and actually decide which alarms should be watched. Perfect, thank you. And I just want to remind everyone that please go ahead and post any questions you may have now in the question pane and we will be answering as we move along here. Um, next question I have is, any fail safe during the power outage? So Gary, you want to take that one? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question and one that we hear quite commonly kind of in tune with uh, what happens if the network goes down. Uh, in a power outage situation, and Jordan and I learned this early on in the process that when we provide access control to a cabinet, there always has to be key override. Mm -hmm. Our electronic technology can't prevent technicians and engineers from being able to get into a traffic cabinet to service or support the, the signaling uh, and traffic systems. So typically what we've been providing with these is our Medico XT intelligent key override or maybe an M3 high security key. So in a complete power outage, you still have a way to access that cabinet. And likewise, I'll go ahead and just throw this out there uh, for a network outage where we're using an online system like Victor's using um, that controller that's an access controller, uh, A1601 that's inside the cabinet. Um, that unit is, is uh, backed up by power supplies or batteries uh, within the cabinet, so it's online. But in the event of a network outage, that, in, that controller is intelligent. It stores the data inside the controller. So even though there's no network connection, I can still access the cabinet and then transactions and historical information 
links to other things within the system. They're all self-contained there in the cabinet. When the network comes back up, all that information that's been stored is uploaded to the system so that uh, that can be reported on later. So there are fail-safe systems that are put in place. And this is why we felt it so important to include the integration with Medico XT is so that people like Victor that deploy this solution, when he does have a power outage or he has people out there with keys, we still have access control in that intelligent key. So we don't want to go and perpetuate the problem that we're trying to solve here and deploy keys that are easy, easily duplicated or easily captured. We want to use something that even when it's offline, we now have a data log that's stored on that key, stored on that core, that when we get that key back, we go pull that core, we can actually still see who was accessing and gain some of that knowledge that we would normally have with online, even in an offline environment. All right, we have another question that came up here. Our agency has been having theft issues with our UPS cabinets. Does this system work outside of a closed network? So the answer is absolutely yes. So we can work within a closed network or we can, this can be deployed in multiple ways. So this can be deployed in a cloud infrastructure. This can be deployed in an on-prem infrastructure, a hybrid infrastructure on a wide open network or even on a closed network. There's multiple ways to deploy this solution. And this can be deployed on our UPS cabinets as well as our traffic cabinets as UPS cabinets are ones that get targeted because some of those components in there are of more value if resold in the right area and can need to also be reutilized in different ways. Jordan, I'll add on to that, that even though uh, there may not be a network connection, whether it's copper or fiber to that cabinet, uh, if there's a way to use cellular connections, I know we've done some of those to where the cabinets are connected back to the network via cradle point or another type of communication, uh, maybe. Uh, digital radio. There are ways to get communication back as well. And what temperature does our product work at? What's the highest or the lowest temperature that the product can work at? So that's, that's a, the go ahead, Jordan. <laughs> no, we both are eager to answer that because we both worked very hard on this one. And Gary, being with Asa Abloy, probably has some more intimate knowledge to that. I'll speak to the outside and then I'd love for Gary to share what the factory has done. This does meet NEMA TS2 standards, so negative 40 degrees Celsius up to plus 70 degrees Celsius or 73, I believe. We have independently tested this. We were lucky to work with one of the states. I did not get permission prior to this call to share which one, so we'll check with them later and email that out but we did put this in the environmental chamber for the specified three days and did some extremely violent temperature changes to both those extremes and did test it through there. But Gary, maybe you can go through what some more of the testing we did on the lock and everything to prove this uh, NEMA TS2 requirements. Yeah, we, we've actually done a lot of uh, our own internal testing. That's something that Asab was used to doing and uh, going through a UL process. We have a lot of that uh, testing gear uh, in-house where we can test temperature ratings, moisture ratings, um, and in, in, in the actual water and rain conditions. Uh, so we've done a lot of that testing in-house. I know that we've got uh, on the online lockout in uh, Phoenix where we're doing testing where it's over, I believe, a couple million cycles now. Jordan, I think you heard that latest, but we're going through several million cycles and testing on that lock with no failures. So again, we, we test those locks to pretty stringent conditions before we ever got it out to uh, the agency that did the, the, the TS2 testing. Yeah, I think this is one question that Victor never asked us because he lives in LA and everybody knows they have the best weather in the world. So he, <laughs> we're not even gonna let him bring up how beautiful his weather is every day and rub it in that he never has to worry about these extremes. And and we're, I think, a mile and a half away from the beach. So it's, yeah, it's, thanks. We really <laughs> all appreciate that. <laughs> well, well, speaking of beach, we have a similar question up ahead. When it comes to salt air, how good does the lock work? I'll let Gary answer that one. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I think the testing that we go through, we've got this deployed uh, quite a bit down in Florida, and with, with no issues there, that's a pretty salty air environment. Uh, down there. Um, we haven't had any issues with it yet, but we go through that testing internally as well. I think uh, some of the equipment that we've got in our factories actually does that that um, humidity and, and, and salt air testing. But uh, with regard to the intelligent keys, 
uh, and the, the locks that, that, uh, that those are used in. We do have uh, kits that come with those so that you can keep those uh, contacts clean and clear uh, in, in dirty environments or those that may uh, uh, be in a humid environment that might have some buildup. So, um, Yeah, and a few other things that, that we see in there is um, the factory that builds this has gone to great lengths to make sure that this is a very robust lock. We've deployed we've, dielectric. We've got ways to, to keep the system operating. We're losing Gary, unfortunately, there. Oh, did you? I'll go on. Okay. Sorry, Gary. <laughs> I'll go on you, to you the next there question. I jumped in there. I actually got a text while we were talking from the product manager who apparently is watching, and he wanted me to share with you guys uh, some of the extreme testing we've done and build quality, adding some dielectric grease to different connections and the way the motor's built um, and the sealing that we've done in order to make sure that this is uh, definitely built for that standard. The only two components that are actually exposed to the outside of the cabinet is the key port, which still has a little flip cover, but it's the Medeco XT key port that's been existing in salt air for 20 years. They've been deployed all over the places and beaches and all rigs and they've survived. And then the HID multi-class reader, which yeah. is deployed absolutely everywhere as well and built for that type of environment. Yeah, those are potted. And one more comment on, on the Medeco uh, XT, um, the traffic cabinet lock. Maintenance in those areas where you've got that that heavy salt air or, or a, a dirty environment, you know, maintenance is important. It's, a, it's two pieces of metal that make contact. Um, the electrodes that uh, make contact with gold tip, so they do uh, they do work, but they do require maintenance if they are in that kind of a harsh environment. Thank you, guys. Uh, we have a question directly for Victor. So, how many intersections are actively actively using this system in Englewood, and how many total intersections do you have? Will it ultimately be deployed at all intersections? As of now, we we've tested on one cabinet. Uh, which is our hub. Uh, we're actually no, we have two of the cabinets, the hubs that are tied together um, on one corridor, and we are expanding it, expanding our network to deploy to about 37 new intersections that we're modifying this year uh, by the end of the year, and then from that point on, we are we are adding it to each of our ITS phases. So. And then any development that is a private development that has mitigation measures will also in, and, and has some mitigation feature to those traffic signals will upgrade the cabinets as well and incorporate this feature. Um, we have a total of 157 signalized intersections that manage this, but also we have a, another 20 to 25 cabinets that are for CMS boards, for um, just ITS devices like mid-block for RSUs that we have to deploy a cabinet to. Um, and, and additional equipment. So a total of them would be about 170 locations that will be deployed. And then in the future, we may add additional cabinets or locations on poles that would have the actual readers themselves tied back to our signalized intersections where our communications switches are. Perfect, thank you, Victor. Uh, one more question regarding certification. Is the solution UL certified or any other type of certification that you guys may want to answer? Um, Jordan might correct me if I'm wrong on the um, the online system with the Access A1601 controller. I believe that is UL listed for access control. Um, but I don't think we've gotten far enough into the solutions to have any additional UL um, certifications. Gary is accurate and we do invite people that are interested as this is a newer solution. If there's a specific certification you're hoping to see, we are actively putting this product through additional certifications for use in all type of different environments. So if there's a one that we haven't mentioned, we'd love for you to share with us so that we can research that. If we have or have not done that, we, we have a lot of fantastic engineering groups that Unfortunately, had we had them all on here, there'd be 40 other people on this panel. And Gary and I would love to act like we know all of these certifications, but we don't. So we'll definitely be happy to reach out and share that information with you. Uh, Despina, we want to try to maybe do one more quick question and then we'll wrap it up for today. Yep, quick question. What is the installation process like? So yeah, I can answer some of that and I'd love for Gary to answer some as well. Uh, we try to make this very easy. 
The goal was to build a solution that could be installed in less than an hour in the field. This can obviously be purchased uh, pre in pre deployment of the entire cabinet as Victor's doing. It can also be retrofitted as we did Victor's proof of concept. Yep. It can be deployed in field in less than an hour. So as Gary mentioned, four bolts in, four bolts uh, back on to the lock, mounts the lock very quickly. Everything's color coded inside the Axis A1601 panel. So it makes it very easy for wiring and very few terminations. And this is powered 24 volts as everything else is inside your traffic cabinet. So there's no special power supply needed. Yeah, it was pretty straightforward. I think it took us maybe 40 minutes per location. The first one was about 40 minutes, and it, but because we got we had nowhere to mount it, obviously you need space, but it, it was very easy. I think we took more time getting to know the system and actually configuring it at, back at our TMC than the actual installation. Gary, you want final word on that? Right. Looks like maybe Gary's frozen again. Yeah. Oh, we uh, lost him. Yeah, I know. All right, so guys, um, if we didn't get to your questions, we do appreciate them. Our team will make sure that we reach back out to you with some information as soon as possible. We'll respond to those. This has been recorded, so if you want this information later on, we can definitely share. We definitely thank you all for attending, everybody for staying through the entire call here. And thank you again to Victor so much for being on this call. Uh, Gary, we got him back. Thank you, Gary, for being on this call as well. For all those that are in the background here, uh, Despina, Tabo, Francois, and anyone else that's on the back end helping us with all these questions, we really do appreciate it. And uh, we'll just close it out here. Uh, if you have any other questions, again, feel free to reach out to us. And we look forward to working with everybody that's on here to continue this further.